Well, hello there and welcome to another edition of Under the Cowling, where we kind of step behind the scenes a little bit and get into in depth to some of these airframes. And I've got uh, two guys here who we can talk about theoretical stuff. They actually lived it, you know, Frank and Gordy here. Now, Gordo actually has his name on the frame rail and Frank, you also flew the, the F-105. How did you, um, how did you get started in aviation? Maybe Frank, you can start. I mean, you re you retired as a captain. Did yes. you retire as a captain? Yeah. And Gordo, you retired as a colonel, yeah. right? Okay. So how did you end up in the USAF, the United States Air Force? I was li I lived in Chicago at the time, and a, a friend of mine it was springtime, uh, May of 1959. 59. 59. Wow, 1959. <laughs> and uh, somebody told me that a new uh, drive-in a drive-in uh, restaurant started up on the north side of, of Chicago and I went up there and O'Hare is there and at the time O'Hare was had a squadron of F-86 D's and I went up there and I was we were having dinner sitting on the back of our car smoking cigarettes talking to girls in this flight of four F-86 D's in echelon come flying over us and I remember looking up and said I gotta do that <laughs> and a couple of days later I went to recreate an office Really? That was it, yeah. That was May, October, I was in the Air Force in pilot training. Really? Yeah. Where'd you do uh, uh, pilot training at? Uh, of course, uh, Lackland initially, and then um, uh, Mariana, Florida, which was a civilian base. Mariana, Florida was um, in the Panhandle. And then Reese Air Force Base in the middle of Texas for my... Uh, T thirty three T thirty three. We have we got one of those. Oh, we yeah. just did I an episode on that on the yeah. other program. Yeah. And Gordo, where did you start out at? How'd you how'd you do this? Well, I grew up in Baton Rouge, and uh, my parents took me to an air show at the Baton Rouge Airport, and the Thunderbirds were there flying one hundreds. I'll to this day never understand how they could get in and out of a five thousand foot runway, but they did. But I was so impressed by the airplanes, the air show, and those nice flight suits, and uh, I actually tried out for the Thunderbirds twice. But I only made the semis. Uh, the people that were picking were all Air Force Academy graduates, and I was from LSU, so I, I wasn't going to get there. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, we don't want to go after the Academy guys, but the Academy <laughs> guys get the pick of the litter. They, you know, they always do, and that, yeah, that just is what it is. So, how did you? Um, well, before we get any further, uh, Greg, who my my wonderful assistant and the tech guy here, who's over off camera. Um, is always a, uh, a stickler for hospitality. He tries to kill me with a drink each week on <laughs> Warbird Wednesday, but you have a wet nap, so hey, if you, you feel a little peak, you is can wipe down. Is this in the budget? This is in the budget. <laughs> and then you have a nice cookie wow. in case your blood sugar is wow. down. And, of course, he always wants to make you properly hydrated, so you have a sparkling water there. I'm going to open this one. I think I'm enjoying it. There you go. It's nice well, and cool. Well, how did you... Uh, uh, we, the 105... Uh, and behind us is uh, bureau number 61108. Uh, this is Combat Kathy. We'll talk about. I actually met Combat Kathy, believe it or not, uh, when we. I did too. You show, you introduced me to. Yes, that. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. And um, we, uh, you know, we've restored this airplane. It's been about 10 years now, going on 10 years. Uh, it came from. It was one of the 12 aircraft that was retired for security training. I think it was at, was it at Lackland? Kelly. Kelly. It was at Kelly. And uh, we have a picture of that in one of the other videos of them actually flying in on their retirement flight. And when we did the research on this, a little background for our viewers at home, uh, Gordo, you called me up, actually, I think, and said, I think I flew that airplane. <laughs> And you actually flew this airplane over Hanoi, I think, right? I, I don't remember exactly where it was, but uh, I have it in my logbook, yeah. We, what we, are the we, odds? Yeah. We, yeah. We you need, know, if you think about that. We need to let everyone know. You, you look at the name, and you say, oh, my goodness, that's locked in in history. Well, not really. It is because it's painted there, but every time a guy would come in to fly, he'd get an airplane with his name on the side. And then... When he left or got shot down, scrape it off and put a new guy's name on it. So the names didn't stay there forever. Right. Yeah. And and the other thing is, with a lot of these airplanes, you didn't know which airplane you were going to fly, whatever oh, was no, available. Yeah. So you didn't, 
that everyone thinks like with like Top Gun, right? Maverick goes out and goose and they get in their airplane and they have their own permanent airplane and everybody flies everything. And you may be Bob or George or whoever, uh, but they... uh, they yeah. don't really maintenance tells you what what tail right are, uh, whatever uh, works yeah. and uh, and there you go i had an airplane with my name on it i think i flew it three times three uh-huh. times that was it <laughs> there you go you got the you got the 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 uh, hollywood shot I right with the flight helmet in, there, in front of it because i didn't, didn't think i'd ever get a chance well there Thank you go that, yeah. so uh, you went through uh, so this is this is uh, just a little bit of history about the the airplane behind us it is a monster. Uh, it's the largest single-seat fighter ever built by the United States Air Force, I think. Built by anyone. By, by anyone. Single engine, single seat, largest. Really? The Russians didn't build anything no. bigger either? They started putting two, two motors in. That's interesting. Yeah. And it was originally built uh, as a low-level nuclear strike yeah. airplane, right? right? Hence the Bombay. Right, which is is real fun as you're trying to restore the airplane and they've cut every hydraulic line in it and everything and you're trying to get in to to clean it up Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. that bombay is interesting what um so you went through you know your your flight training got your wings uh escape and evasion did you go through escape and evasion training after that oh sure where'd you where'd you do that stead air force base stead at stead Yeah. yeah me too but you too what um did you go into 105's Immediately, no, or? I was flying the F-100 out of Okinawa, and really? the, and the wing that I was that I joined right after I joined it as a brown bar, the wing was converted to F-105s. So within probably six months of getting to Okinawa, I got out of the F-100 and into the 105. That's like that's like going from a from a Yugo to a Mack truck. I mean, that's a big shift. When I landed in Okinawa, the wing commander who was George Gabreski. Gabby Gabreski. Really? Yeah, I said he wanted to meet me because I was a brown bar. And he said, you got to be the luckiest brown bar in the, in the world because yeah. this wing is going to 105s. And I had, I had had like a year, maybe a little less, in the F-100. You, did you get to know him at all? I flew with him one time. Scared the hell out of me. <laughs> he was one of the roughest pilots I've ever flown with. Really? He didn't do anything smooth. Nothing. It was really yeah, just really rough that. with the air. Yeah. Describe rough so people under non pilots understand. Very rough with the controls. Just you know? very abrupt. The, the, wingman, the wingman hated to fly with him because he didn't consider them at all. <laughs> he just went out there and flew. And I was in the back seat of an F with him, and I was scared that the whole while I was there, I was scared to that, that he was going <laughs> to kill me. Really? But he was a very nice guy. Very, very uh, Gabreski nice was obviously out of World War II, yeah. a, a major ace. He was a full bull, and uh, he had our wing. Yeah, and I think, and I, I'm going to maybe, you correct me if I'm wrong, but he's in P-47s, wasn't P-47s, he? P-47s. Yeah, there think you he, go. I, I got lucky. He had, yeah. <laughs> he had a number. I mean, I think like 25 or 30 kills in World War II. Really? Those guys were larger than life, yeah, weren't they? Yeah. His Robin son went in the Air Force guys. also. Yeah, he's, he's still around. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Well, Bob Friend told me a story one time about he landed when he got in. He was in P-51s. And the commander came to him, and basically his wingman wouldn't stay with him. And he said to him, your, your, your story reminded me. That he looked right at him, and he just brand new. He looked at me and says, you're my wingman, and if you don't stay with me, you're fired. And that was, uh, I can imagine, you know, that's, that's not fun, flying yeah. for the commanding officer. Yeah. So, so, Gordo, how did you end up in, uh, in, in 105s? Well, I went to pilot training at Del Rio, Texas, Laughlin Air Force Base, and... Uh, when I graduated, I was first in my class, and we ended up having eight first lieutenants, which we were when we graduated, or at Nellis anyway. Eight first lieutenants got a, into a class that went through training at Nellis and then to Tockley, and then they split us up to three different squadrons, three, three, and two. But uh, of the eight, five, we beat the odds. It was a 50-50 deal, you know, going over there to whether you can get 50, 100. Fifty-fifty that you were going to get get 100 or die or, or 100 and you had to explain how to get to 100 people don't understand well, you, that a counter was a mission over the, the boundary of north vietnam and uh we we got five of our guys made 100 uh, two were pow's and one just the airplane blew up out of the sky they, they hit it with a big piece of triple a uh, and uh w- later on on the second tour uh the, gary smith was one of us that made it and he, fl- he flew an F-4 uh, and ended up bailing out and in South Vietnam got picked up. He's still around. 
but I think Gary and I are the only two of the eight that are still with us. Bob Lodge was a legend in his time. He was a, a lieutenant with us, academy graduate. Uh, I, I, I tell stories about him. We were going through training at Nellis, and we, he says, you want to go gambling with me? A guy had a locker. Could count cards, huh? Yeah. yeah. And, and so I said, sure. So I, we walked up to the Stardust, and, and the big burly guy says, you're not welcome here. So he was not because he never lost money. Really? And, and on our 90, <laughs> on our 90, on our hundredth mission, I was on the board as lead, and he was the wingman. And I pulled off, and he says, "You got one hung, one seven, one seven hundred fifty pound bomb hung on a mur, multiple ejector rack on the center line." And I said, "Well, just move out of the way, and I'll toggle it off." He says, "No, one G, no flaps, two forty max." His mind just knew what was in the book. He was just that wow. smart a guy. So I did that, and then we changed leads because we'd practiced the 100th mission with him in the lead. I'd rather fly the wing anyway. And we beat the air, airfield up. <laughs> well, I, I imagine in this airplane. So so before the, the air, did any did either one of you, though, train in the, what the airplane was designed for with the nuclear strike, the low level? Oh, yeah. That's all we did on Okinawa. Okinawa <laughs> wing was, uh, was nuclear uh, detergent, deterrent. And we had 18, I guess it's okay for me to say that now, we had 18 F-105s with Mark 28s, 1.1 megaton, in the bomb bay. All and the time? they all had a target, yeah. So they, they were hot loaded? Yes. Wow. And we would uh, go out and start them once a day just to make sure that they were working. And our targets were in the Vladivostok area, North Korea, and China. And we the said, the one thing people may not understand, by the way, for those of you who are watching this, uh, if you want to ask questions, put questions into the comment section. Greg will bring them over to me or let me know if you've got questions. There's no problem. Go ahead and ask the questions because I'm just we're just having a conversation here and I may forget something or not ask something that you're interested in. So ask questions. So there we go. Being by an airfield. We almost, we just got two Flak 38s in that are off camera here. We almost shot a Stearman down yesterday <laughs> who kept interrupting it. Or last week when we were doing this. So uh, hot loaded, which means you have a nuke on board. Yes. You couldn't tell your family, right? I mean, no, it, they knew. My, my wife and I did she? knew I was, you know, because we had four or five days a month that we had to set alert 24 7. So we were in an alert facility, uh, sleeping with two or three guys in a in a in a bunk bunk room, and uh, and we'd have ex exercises every now and then. The bell would go off, and we'd pretend that we're going to go ahead and uh, fly a mission. The uh, when you do something like that, you're the, I guess the airplane, and and again, guys, you did it. And I'm just kind of going off memory. Here. <coughs> the airplane was low level strike, right? So nap of the earth going hot when we got near the target and normally you, we went high enough because we were pretty far from everything so we had to right. hit a tanker you hit the tanker came out of japan we'd hit the tanker and then we would go as far as we can high altitude because well it didn't matter you, there was nobody coming back from those missions why don't you talk about that a little bit as to why you got a 1.1 1. So 1. 1. 1 megaton bomb in the megaton bomb. in the bay and they, they were all lay downs we would fly in real low and our targets were almost always airfields and we dropped this mega, uh, one megaton bomb, and when it came out of the, which is, by the way, being in the airplane when you drop that thing is an experience. It, it came out of the airplane, and a parachute opened up, he had a hardened nose, and he would uh, pitch down and dig a hole in the runway, and 60 seconds later, as we are going as fast as we can, 1.1 megaton bomb would go off. That was not, we would probably survive that, most of us. The problem was, now here we are, in the Vladivostok area, North Korea, or uh, uh, China, how do we get back? Yeah. And the target said, I said, uh, there was going to be a destroyer or a uh, submarine at a lat long in the China Sea. So That's, waiting for you, and you ditched the airplane. And, yeah. and the, um, what, I, I got very lucky when I was young. I got into a B-1A when they were putting the software in, and, and a, uh, I've always been a little bit of an airplane freak. We were talking about that before we started, and so they briefed me about the sensors in the airplane and the ability of that airplane to fly nap of the earth with the sensors. You have, what, a Doppler in this? A Doppler? Yeah, very good with Doppler. Yeah, Doppler? Excellent. The Doppler down low, did that give you train following, or, or how did, were you flying we had stick? Doppler, Doppler got us to the target, but we had, the radar had the, um, 
uh, had a floor in it. We, so we could put a floor in it. We would go down to that floor and stop. And it would keep you safe from hitting the ground. Really? Yeah. And it, 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 you know, it didn't work all that well because it was way ahead of itself. Yeah. Did you ever try and fly it? Yeah. Well, we, we did really this. Well. You know, you're asking a question. We, we did this in training only because they wanted us to get familiar with the airplane. We The first uh, 100 hours, like, no, not 100, some small number of hours, we were in the back seat of the F model at Nellis. They, they didn't have any D models at Nellis. They were all in, at Takli or Karada. Right. Or Kodima. But uh, so we would, we would sit in the back seat and practice the new deliveries, but mainly it's just to get a feel for the airplane. Really? Yeah. What um, uh, airplane, uh, you obviously got a burner, yeah. and it was, always, uh, it was always interesting to me that this airplane has a gun and the F-4 didn't, right? Mm -hmm. Which, which, which yeah. doesn't make any sense yeah. at all. Uh -huh. But um, what, um, and the Russians are, and we'll get into Vietnam here in a minute, which is a completely different animal but uh russian air defense primarily sams migs and uh and triple a tri box triple box triple a they're yeah. trying to get that was the real threat it was yeah. a triple a yeah, yeah. yeah so they were for the folks at home what they were trying to do is they do i i think and again this is from what i have read you guys lived it but they box you in with those uh, with sams or whatever and try to get you to fly through the triple a right yes. and you hit you going through it is well, the, the threat of the sams at least when yeah. i was there may, forced you down low exactly and that's where the flak was the most uh yeah. you know, the most dangerous yeah so. you would have you know when we'd come back we'd say well that was a triple a day or mig day which you'd hope it yeah. would be because they wouldn't shoot anything into the air while the megs are up and, and you could evade a meg pretty easily but uh on a triple a day it was uh katie bar the door really yeah, yeah. Well, that's they that's scary. Up, they could put up flak. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And they didn't have smokeless uh, gunpowder. So when a flak site was firing, it was literally a cloud of white smoke and, and these fireballs coming out of it, and usually going right at you as you dove in there. That's the other thing that most people don't realize. I didn't, my daughter was talking about the Navy during World War II, and she said, you know, they used to dive. So that's what this airplane did probably better than any other yeah. airplane. It was an excellent bomber and a dive bomb, period. It was, you put target, you would put eight 750 pound bombs on the target. Just iron bombs, yes. not Just, guided. No, yeah, we didn't dumb have them. bombs. Oh, no. Okay, so the, did you guys know each other when you were in the service? Uh -uh. You were there very, I was there in 60, December 66 to July 67 from the first tour. Early 65, we arrived at Da Nang in January of 65. Okay. In South Korea. South Korea. So let's transition. And by the way, the three people that are, we get really down in the weeds on this stuff, and, and that's why we do this. We're, we're going to talk shop. The three people that are on the YouTube channel have all lapsed into a coma by now, I think, <laughs> probably, because we're talking tech here. But uh -huh. all right, so NAP of the Earth, nuclear delivery systems. Uh -huh. Now we're going to Vietnam, yeah. right? You got a huge airplane, heavy bomb load, and carry a lot of bombs what's the there's a big transition from you know flying airfield disruption or whatever you're doing with a nuke to having to go do precision strike uh what was that i mean you were there early so yeah. what was that transition like we never recognized the ability of the airplane conventionally until we until we got to vietnam i had never flown with an mr you know uh, multiple injector rack with eight or six 750 pound bombs before I got to Vietnam. We really? Would we would drop one 750 at a time for practice, you know, when we were at, at, in the gunnery range. So all of a sudden we're taking off at 52,000 pounds with all these bombs. And if we didn't get water, we got afterburn. If we didn't get water, we aborted because yeah. the airplane would not get airborne. Really? So that was a, it was a real awakening for us. And that's when I began to really appreciate this airplane until you start doing that. And then when you get to the target, which Doppler would get you right there, and you got into a dive, you were gonna put bombs on the target, unless you you know, did something wrong. It was very accurate. How about, how about you, Gordo? Any observations? <laughs> uh, nothing to add to that. <laughs> really? No. So the, the uh, so you're, you're flying heavy, and when you fly an airplane heavy like that, uh, you were talking about trying to get off the ground, right? 
so yeah. so in a in an interval like that you're going you, you got a heavy bomb load you're you're going off the deck you're taking off mm -hmm. minimal fuel and then you hit the tanker yes we hit the tanker um, usually on the uh, Thai border on the Thai side of the border with the Laos and then we go to our target and then so now you're full of gas yeah. um, not necessarily full of gas but Topped off. We Topped got, off. We to, got four or five thousand pounds. You got enough to go in and and then uh, egress uh, mm -hmm. from the target. What uh, um, what was with you at that time? The I've never really understood how the North Vietnamese used their air force. You know, they they had Megs yeah. and we have a seventeen and a twenty one. Yeah. I don't know if they had fifteens in the arsenal or not. There was talk about them, but I never saw really? or heard of them. And then you've got you've got Sams. Those are SA Two. twos, yeah. and then obviously all kinds of different caliber AAA. What uh, uh, CAD did you have uh, air defense suppression go in with you, or would they beat the target up early, or fighter I escort? Speak, I can't speak for we uh, we were going so far north. We were the only ones there. Uh, same with me. The, I never I never was. Uh, um, escorted with anything. Yeah. We'd run an F-4s occasionally, but they were loaded with bombs too. Yeah. Really? We, yeah. we were uh, preceded in the target area by wild weasels, yeah. and their job was to get the, get the SAM sites to radiate and fire, and then they had missiles that they could fire at that site that launched the missiles. The problem was it was sort of like feeding a kitty, a big kitty, a lion. Because you have to get inside the lion's cage, inside Feed their, him and kitty. Yeah, inside of their arcs of their ordnance to fire your ordnance because we didn't have any. We had one la large missile, a uh, harm, that would go in about 25, 30 miles. So you could kind of do one to one that way. But And you wanted to get rid of it because it was almost as big as one of these fuel tanks. And it was really? a lot of drag. Yeah. So a harm homing anti radiation missile, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that. So let's talk about Wild Weasel for a second. Yeah. How did, who came up with the name Wild Weasel? Do you know, it, it, would you just, we have to figure that out. Greg, I'm, I'm gonna look at you. At some point we gotta figure that one out. Uh -huh. but, so you, uh, Gordo, you, you flew Wild Weasel, didn't Second you? tour, yeah, but, but the war was basically over when I got there. Okay, so why don't you go through the concept for people that don't understand Wild Weasel, you're okay. flying a strike mission, you're in a big heavy airplane, they're going in ahead of you, and... Yeah, well, the weasels, you've got a two-seater. The guy in the back is an Ewo, or a bear, we'd call him. And he'd, a and bear. Bear. Trained bear. And, yeah, and we'd call... A trained bear, I like yeah, that. And he'd call us the frogs. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, a very good relationship. So uh, there was a six-month training course to become a weasel at Nellis before you went... And for my second tour, before I went back. But... Uh, you, you you take off, generally uh, 20 airplanes go, D models go in the morning and 20 in the afternoon, and four or eight weasels, depending upon crew availability and, and airplane availability. How many missiles did the weasels have per aircraft? Just one? Or? Well, uh, it depends on the configuration. Generally, you'd have two. Uh, you know, you could have the Shrike, which would, was a short-range missile. Right. And didn't really bother you to fly with the Shrike. It was less of a bother than a full fuel tank. But uh, if you had the big one, the Harm, it uh, it was really a drag to carry it around. It was such. A, it was like, I think, uh, 1,700 pounds or something like that. So if 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 you got rid of it, uh, now you were a lot more maneuverable than you were with it. Okay. So you wanted to get rid of it as soon as you could going inbound. And your idea. Here we go again, the must, fun of must, living on an airfield. Is there an air, airport around here? Yeah, there might be. <laughs> but uh, the uh, the thing with the, 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 the harm, you wanted to get rid of it, and, and uh, so the bear would be back there listening to signals and trying to pick out, and, and you could you could program the harm to where you wanted it to go. You couldn't do it with a shrike. The shrike, you just lo lobbed it up. You, you got your nose 20 or so degrees up and, and, and then pickled it, and it fell, and it... Flew, fell, flew into a basket. It all depended on the uh, dynamics of when you launched it, where it was going. And hopefully when it's nose down, there's somebody down there radiating a signal that's tied to the frequency in, in the seeker. And, and that's a gimme too because there's four or five different ranges of, of uh, SAMs temp, uh, you know, frequency-wise. So if, if they're not on the same frequency as, as the, the Shrike, 
it, it just goes in there. But well, the key is they knew they could see on their radar when when the, you pulled up and when when you fired something, and so they would generally go off signal at that time, just shut the thing down. Well, and that that's kind of uh, whether you hit them. We'll talk yeah. about the technology. Whether you hit them or you get them to turn their exactly. their radar off, yeah, you they're still blind at exactly. that point. Yeah. And uh, for the folks at home, the emitters on these SAMs would emit a a certain frequency that mm -hmm. that the planes would sniff for and look for. Was it a high? Do you know? Remember, it was a high band frequency, or, or what? What was it? Do they know? There were, I think, two or three different uh, versions of what was in the nose of the Shrike and it picked up certain frequencies. And if, if they were using a different frequency that day, the strike was basically blind. It was just going to nose over and hit wherever it was going to hit. Really? Yeah. And then, so you fire the missile. The missile goes at that emitter. It doesn't go after the rocket. No, it goes yeah, after yeah. the emitter. And then when it gets close, uh, it has a ball bearings. Or it wasn't a, a strike weapon. It was like a... It would yeah. spray, wouldn't right. it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It had like something in it that would just uh, fire a radius because yeah. what you're really trying to do is destroy the um, the dish yeah, or the right. the truck, yeah. right? Yeah. Knock him offline. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it was going after what that radiating dish. That was the only thing it was looking for. That, it, that's the only thing it knew in the world was where what where is that dish on the ground that is sending a signal to the rear end of the SAM to to send it right to, to the airplane. So and. And people don't understand another fallacy in um, movies is the missile follows you all over and does the wild E coyote and all that stuff. It'll just get close. And if it gets close, it's either going to miss you or it's going to blow up or do something else, well, right? I've got a story about that. I was on the wing of a weasel one mission. We were north of Flood Ridge. And uh, the guy in the back seat of the weasel said, Launch, launch, 10 o'clock. He had a real high-pitched voice. And so I looked over at 10 o'clock, and lo and behold, there it is, like a big white telephone pole coming out of the sky about 10, 15 miles away. And I, I watched it nose over, and, of course, the lead now is nosing down, doing a glib two maneuver. I'm not sure what glib meant, but it was the nose over to get yourself some airspeed so you could later on turn hard. So uh, I looked over, and it was coming down, and... I said to myself, I'm, I'm here at kind of line abreast, I said, well, he's not going to get both of us. So I, I did a big barrel roll and ended up back here so I could see if, if he's coming after me or my flight lead. Well, he was after the flight lead. I got to see the greatest air show you've ever seen. The, the 105's down like this, doing maybe 550, and the, the missile's coming here. And just before it got there, he did the glib too. He went a hard G. And the airplanes, even the 105 with these little wings, can outturn a SAM because the SAM just got little small wings. Right. So I saw the airplane from the rear go up hard, a lot of contrails on top, and the, and the missile went this way and exploded and actually uh, sent shrapnel into the rear end of the airplane. And so uh, the kid in the back seat said, we're hit, we're hit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I escorted him back. I think we went to uh, in somewhere uh, th uh, somewhere in northern Thailand to land, but he made it out. He, he made just, it out. It, it was leaking fl fluid everywhere, but he made it. Well, that's I, that's the thing I, I think that's probably a misnomer. Uh, gentlemen, we actually have a question from our online audience. It yeah. has to do with it. We're getting a little bit of the political here, but uh, the Johnson administration and the uh, – the restrictions on the ROE oh, that were yeah. placed upon targeting. I would, uh, would They'd like a, a little bit of insight into your experience I would be happy to talk about that. All yeah. right. Well, let's uh, – Greg is off camera. The Johnson administration and the uh, targeting restrictions. So – Like handcuffs. Handcuffs. Yeah. Well, they, they, they were, there were circles around Hanoi and Haiphong that we were not to go inside of because there were Russians there. Right, and we're going to talk about same, that in a minute. Same yeah. reason we didn't bomb the airfields because they were Russians. We didn't want to hurt or upset the Russians, and so uh, one of the saddest commentaries that later on we find out from reading General Piotrowski's book that uh, our targets for, for each day were sent to us from the Pentagon, but really through the White White House Pentagon, and then to us. The our, the targets. Or JCS targets were what they called the, the, the big ones, the, the, the serious ones up close to Hanoi. And we thought, well, okay, we're going to go bomb those and everything will be this way. And we knew we were going to, into the 
most heavily defended area in the history of aerial warfare. And oh, why? Because our leadership, and it was uh, Dean Rusk, I think, was the one in this interview with Peter Arnett. Dean Rusk uh, was asked the question, is it true that you're telling the North Vietnamese what the targets are? And he, and he said yes, because we didn't want the North Vietnamese people to be hurt by the bombing. He, you know, altruistically thinking they will go away from the target area if we tell them what it's going to be the next day. Well, what that really meant was they take the panel hitches that were on all the AAA, drag the, the thing, the guns around, so that now they're firing in a small area of North Vietnam. So that's why it was the most heavily defended area in the history of area warfare. So they but, knew you were coming. Yeah, it was like telling Berlin we're going to bomb Dresden tomorrow. So, right. You know, but uh, that was you know, the, the politics of the day was uh, we're not really in a war. We don't really want to until Nixon got in. And I got a story to tell about that also. Well, tell it. Let, let's okay. do that. I want to talk about this uh, shoot down and, and some of the other stuff. Okay. But what about that? Well, Nixon got tired of uh, Kissinger and Le Docteau in Paris having tea every day and nothing happening. So Nixon told uh, uh, Kissinger, tell them to come across with a true bargaining position or, or, or else. Well, they didn't change anything. And, and so uh, it, they still had the advantage because they knew where the targets were. They were coming you know, ahead of time. So uh, Nixon, however, ha actually had cut that off. So now they didn't know where we were coming. So uh, they did not respond to that uh, entreaty from him. And they, uh, Nixon said, he called in the JCS and said, I want you to win the war. Well, how novel is that? Nixon said, win the war. So in December of 72, uh, he allowed us to now bomb the airfields and the circles around Hanoi and Haiphong went away. We bombed targets right near the center of Hanoi and Haiphong. The POWs were doing this because they knew we were going to put some real pressure on them because all they could hear before this was bombs off in the distance. So after uh, 28 days of bombing the hell out of them, they did this in Paris, and they signed a peace accord. And I'll tell you what, we, we just don't do a good job teaching history around in this country. We were at peace with them as, far, as, as, as peaceful as you can be compared to North and South Korea with a North and South with a demarcation right. line. We were at peace with them from about January to June of that year because they had said, okay, we, we, we don't want to get bombed anymore. So we stopped bombing them. Everything was fine. And then what happened? Well, Nixon uh, got in trouble with Watergate, and so he lost all his political power. And uh, he, you know, by then we'd gotten the POWs back also, which was a great thing. But, right. So uh, with Nixon under all this uh, political stress, the Democrats decided that they were not going to fund our half of the DMZ. And so the North can read the paper, and they saw that. And so they reattacked and took over, you know, attacked Saigon and took over. So my story, and this is the goddamn truth, we won the war, if you can call Korea a win, it was sort of the DMZ. We won the war, and then Congress gave it away. Wow. Wow. Well, let's talk a little bit about, you talked about POWs, and both of you went through escape uh, and evasion training. What um, I was told... And I've never talked to you guys about this. I was told by a guy who went through at the time that said, "There's a, by the way, there's a very good RAND report about this, about uh, aircraft that are shot down and what happened and guys that disappeared and, and a yeah. bunch of other things. And if you're out there, go out and find that. I can't remember the name of it, but it was done about 15 years ago, and it looked at all the American shoot-downs and what happened to people who didn't come back and stuff like that. But I was told by uh, one of these guys that was a MISTI pilot... And we can get into Misty maybe if we have time. But he he was told that if you see a Russian or a Chinese officer, you're dead. In other words, that you're going to go back to China or Russia. They're going to torture yeah. you. They're going to get everything they can out of you, and you're going to disappear. Yeah. Is that accurate? I, I have heard similar things, and I don't know any POW that, that I ever heard of who ended up in... Uh, North Korea or China, so probably that, so. Probably that so. RAND report was interesting because after the Soviet Union fell, they could get in there and they did all this, and a lot of those aircraft were were black aircraft, right? They yeah. were on uh, CIA or spy missions, yeah. 
and there was nobody had any idea how many of our you guys might have because yeah. people were flying them how many of those airplanes got shot down i mean there were a number of them and the russians recovered the crews and those guys just just disappeared yeah i've read about it and that's about all so you frank you have the unique uh experience of ejecting from one of these airplanes uh do you mind talking about it no no not at all so why don't you take us through that and then i'm sure we'll have some follow-up questions I'll, I'll make it brief uh, we were see a lot of the things that uh, he was talking about as far as the missiles in the in the 30 mile circle when i got to be i was there at the very very beginning i flew on the first mission march 20, march 2nd 65 into North Vietnam, just north of the DMZ, 40 miles, it's called Zambang, and we, we flew that mission, which was the first. Now, at the time, we, we were involved in the Rolling Thunder, which was a joke. Yeah. Every time we went, every day that passed, we went a little further north, and then um, about three days before I got shot down, they, they fired a missile from inside that 30 mile circle and shot down two F-4s. And well, we thought, you know, when we got back from that, I was flying that day, and we got back, we said, well, tonight or tomorrow, we're gonna go in there and get those missiles. They waited three days. That was on the 24th of September. We went there on the 27th of September. We may as well have sent them a telegram saying we're coming. Yep. So they put together 46 airplanes from Takli and Karat. We went to this area, which is supposed to house the, the missiles, and they weren't there. There was white, um, tree tree limbs and stuff like that to make it look. Oh, like they it. they gummied them up. And they got six of us out of the forty six. They shot down six. I was the only one that got hit and got far enough west so that I was away from the city. I was not in in the city, and uh, I was in some very thick stuff. I ejected at a very high speed, so high that I was blacked out for probably a number of seconds because I don't remember when I came to in the chute. I don't remember hearing the airplanes go flying away, or I never saw my airplane. So I must have been blacked out for quite a while. So you eject from the airplane. The airplane the ejection seat has an automatic sequence, separate from the seat. Yeah. Then uh, it opens your chute. It opens your chute there. for you. You're out. Completely. You have a survival vest on, right? Yes. Did you have the radio? Yeah, we had a spare radio. We knew that there was a radio in the survival kit we sat on, and right. we all carried our own radio and water and things like that and I when I landed I had landed in a real thick real thick uh, it's called elephant grass and uh, that's what saved me because they would have got me I was a 30, 30 35 miles directly west of the center of Hanoi which is pretty much uh, you know you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get up. picked up but the Air Force you know they don't leave you they uh, I, I having been there from January to July, I knew that when an airplane was down, it was all out effort by everybody, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, they were gonna try and get this pilot out if he was talking. And I was the only one of the six that was talking. And uh, so, so SAR, Search, search and Rescue, rescue yeah. got you, and, or came out for yeah. you. So you're in the elephant grass, yeah. right? Yeah. Can you hear him looking for you? Yes, the first hour or so, I didn't hear anything. It was very quiet. Uh, it was, it was alarming to be. It was so quiet, right. it was alarming. And then all of a sudden, I had two A1 Navy A1s came in, and they picked me up within the first hour. Great, great guys. Really? Yeah, they uh, they were called uh, Canasta, Canasta Lead and Two. They got me. They told me Lead told me I got you. I see you. Which he, he didn't see me, but he was turning around us, me. And I looked up his wing, and I saw him, and I said, I'm looking right up your wing at you. And he says, I got you, which was really satisfying for me because I figured somebody knows exactly where I am. And by at hour three, now they worked their way up the hill, but it was pretty steep. And I had done this on purpose, try to eject somewhere where it was very thick and, um, and uh, steep. Uh, I heard them, at first I just heard noises. And then one of the guys that was capping me said, hey, they just pulled a couple of buses up at the road at the bottom of that hill, and they're unloading people. I, I always wondered why they didn't shoot at them, but they didn't. Uh, eventually, I could hear their voices, and then they started doing something that really scared me, and that is firing volleys of bullets, just 
a full estate of, of firing and then stop. And then they'd wait a couple minutes and do it again. So they were firing into the brush? I have no idea. Uh, wow. So was, you're, was, you're talking, you're, you're talking, they kind of got an idea where you are. Yeah. Um, now let's talk about your compass. Okay. So when they, I was on the ground, I went through all of my survival gear on my vest, but also all of the survival gear that, that I was, had been seated, seated on. And I remember, you know, your survival school techniques come back very quick when you're on the ground. And I remember that somewhere in there was a tiny little compass. It's about that, we call it a button compass. And what we were supposed to do was swallow it. And the reason we swallowed it was two or three days later, you'd pass it. And it was indestructible, I guess. And if you could find it, you kept it for the rest of your life, which I did. I still have it at home. Gordo's really enjoying this one. Yeah, yeah. Yummy, yummy. Yeah, that's uh, well, that's a good party favor. You know, in fact, you did that to your kids. You told me. I did. I, years, years later, I never talked about Vietnam, Vietnam to my kids. And one of my daughters came in and said, "Today we were talking about Vietnam in, in class." And I told him my dad uh, flew flew in the Air Force. And I remembered I had run into that, you know, maybe a year or two before. I found it, and I ran upstairs, and I got it, and I came back down, and I passed it around to the, uh, all my kids and my wife, and they all looked at it and said, wow, that's really cool. Then I told that story, and they were going, ah! Yeah. <laughs> was cool. it brown? No, it wasn't. <laughs> it's still, I still, I take it here when I'm a docent. Do you? And yeah, I show it, Kevin, not all the time, but occasionally. If you get an opportunity, come here, and for, you'll let them you'll let them hold it right mm -hmm. yeah there you yeah. go so so they come in a helo comes in a helicopter comes yeah. in uh and you you were in a harness right it was a it wasn't a harness it was a we call it a, a horse collar right fat fit under your arms very uncomfortable if you're in it for a while and i was in it for 20 minutes and it was extremely uncomfortable they hook you up yeah. lift you out now the always broke the chopper's hoist broke. It was not a combat chopper. It was a cargo chopper that they had put there because it, it had the range to get up where I was. Really? And they, and they got me about 10 feet off the ground. And all the while, they're shooting at him and the A1s that were circling us. And, uh, and he hovered there for about 20 minutes and then uh, went over to a dry rice paddy that I had seen when I was in the chute on the way down and landed, sent me down in the mud he landed next to me, I jumped in the airplane, and as I was diving into the helicopter, we could hear the automatic weapon from a little building that was at the bottom of this. this They're shooting at the helicopter on the yeah. way out. Yeah. Did you go to a, a ship, or did you go? In the Confinam. we went to the Confinam. Actually, we went to Vincennes. Okay. Uh, and the reason we did that was because the, the PACAF general, Hunter Harris, little guy, uh, maybe five foot five or six, he was the five-star general. He had come there to find out what went wrong yesterday. And, uh, and I ended up, I, had, I, I smelled like a goat. Yeah. Obviously, been in this flight suit uh, and on the ground and spend the night in Lima and Lima And you've just eaten a compass. Yeah. Yeah, you're I, probably Lima's not in a very good mood. Yeah. I, Lima, Lima 36 night. Lima 36, Charlie, was the first night where I spent the night there. And then we went to Vincennes in an airplane. And I got to sit next to General Harris and tell him what I, why I had done. Yeah, he, he couldn't have been more accommodating. Really? And he said, what can I do for you? And I said, get me back to Corral. Get me back to my squadron. And he did. He put me in the back of his C-135, which was highly polished for a five-star <laughs> general, yeah. with his seal on the side, and flew me back to Karat, and my squadron was there to meet me. Also, band, the Thai knew that this four-star general was coming in. They had an army band there. You had a band me. for you. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and I was sitting in the, in the back. There's was some seats in the back in 135. And when I saw all of that going on, I sat back there. And he got out of the cockpit and he said, Frank, come here. And he made me go out first. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Really? And that, that's a, lot of, a lot of talk has been about what I looked like when I came out of there. And that damn Chuck Horner, who was on the same mission as I was. Really? Yeah, he said I had puke on my flight too. Bullshit. <laughs> I did not puke. I, I drank a lot of scotch. Cover your ears at home. Bullshit. We just yeah. said bullshit, but there was no puke on your plate. There was no puke. Dirt, 
filth, sweat, <laughs> with no puke. Chuck That's Horner. I, th that name does yeah. ring a bell. Oh, yeah, he's been here a couple of oh, times. Oh, yeah, I, I know who Chuck Horner yeah. is. Yeah, well, so let's talk a little bit. So did you just go back and, and you just went back to doing what you were doing? Yeah, I, I was sore everywhere. So was, you were sore? I was very sore. I, I lived on sleeping pills and painkillers. And then two days later, I flew an instrument check ride because I needed an instrument check ride. Then I went right back to flying missions. We don't have a hard out here. We're going to go a little bit more. We don't have a commercial or anything we got to yeah. do. So we'll keep talking for it because this is really good stuff. Um, we haven't talked about Megs. We've talked about Sam's. Yeah. We've talked about jinking and doing the things we got to do. Uh, <clears throat> People have a romantic notion of aerial combat and all that. What did, how did the uh, North Vietnamese employ their MiGs? Any observations on any of that stuff uh, with, with their Air Force? Well, uh, they were generally uh, in a two ship, uh, just two airplanes. And I remember one particular mission, we, I rolled in and I was with the full ship. And I'm going down 45 degrees, and I, something catches my eye, and I look out and say, there's a MiG-17 going down with me. I don't know what he's trying to do, maybe distract me, or keep me from... He's going down with you. Right, yeah, I mean, maybe he's on the other side of the hangar, far away, you know, maybe... Off your degrees, wing. Off the wing. So I pulled out, but I had the really fun job of being Hank Higgins' wingman. And Hank, Henry Hank Higgins was just a rough-ass guy. The first time I met him at Doc Lee, we were in the stag bar, and we started talking and drinking. And I noticed he had a, a, a G-suit uh, with a, uh, or on his, on his flight suit, he had the little uh, knife pocket. And oh, you don't keep the knife pocket on because you have a G-suit outside that that has a knife pocket. So we got into a little, he was a big guy like I was. And we got him rolling around on the floor, and I ripped his leg off and all this stuff. Next day, I find out he's my flight commander. <laughs> but but we, had okay. a great, we had a great time together. He liked to lead, and particularly lead uh, formation landings. And I liked to fly formation. I got so good at formation landings at Tock Lee. We'd come in, and, and just as soon as I saw the main gear touch, I'd wave at mobile. Yeah. <laughs> and then pull the drag chute. But Hank... Yeah, by the way, for people at home, that's not easy to do. No. Right. Well, you, you, you do this do. every day, it, it, yeah. It's, yeah. things became it's simple. Yeah. But, but as far as MiGs, uh, one day we were coming outbound, and Hank really wanted to get a MiG. He just was drooling to get a MiG. And we're coming outbound as a two-ship. We started as a four, but you know, three and four go off their way, and one and two are here. And I'm over here, and I look down, I see a MiG-17 down there three or four miles away. I said, lead, there's a MiG, 10 o'clock low. And so he, said, he, he goes in after, and we're both, my gun camera film showed up on the cover of Aviation Week or something like that uh, within a year. I'd never been able to see it. I saw it in base ops somewhere, but I didn't you know, write down what... Uh, Greg, we should see if we could find that. That would be interesting if we yeah. could dig that up. The, the, picture, the picture on the cover shows... A MiG-17 with smoke coming out the left uh, wing and the 105 in an overshoot. And that was my gun camera film showing that because we'd both been firing at him. Really? So, But it ha I went in and testified that he got that MiG. Well, there you go. And, and then uh, a separate time, the day after they really had a bad day with us and, and wiped us off the face of the earth almost on a mission, uh, we, we got some orders that we could go to the MiG bases and, and, and fire that, shoot at them. So we took all the bombs off. We just had AIM-9s on the wings so we could go after MiGs, you know, which you couldn't do with bombs. The gun would be useful, but the missile would help too. So I'm, 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 here's Lee and here's two, me, three and four out here. We're going in through a, below an overcast. And I looked out and I said, and because my missile is talking to me now, it's going rawr, rawr, Talking rawr. to you, which yeah. means it's giving you a signal it's getting, that it's yeah, giving you a growl. It's, yeah. getting, it's getting a heat source out in right. front of it. So I, said, I looked out and said, there's a MiG. He had just come out of the sky and he didn't know we were back here, maybe a mile away. And I, I looked over at Lee and I said, why isn't he firing? Why isn't he firing? I said, oh, the hell with this. And I fired the missile off. And I watched it, and it was going right toward the MiG until it got very close, and the MiG must have seen it or something because he did a hard turn, and he outturned the missile. But really? Uh, that, yeah, that was. 
That's, yeah, a, yeah. that's a standard maneuver to break a lock. Yeah, you yeah, you uh, turn into it uh, with yeah, a real hard yeah, G. Yeah. And then uh, the last story uh, that I had with the MIG, we were going in the water route, which was out and around, and then come in north of Haiphong to bomb a target. So we pulled off the target, and I was four, because I was a lieutenant, and in front of me was a major on about his fourth mission, so he didn't know where the hell he was. But right. that, that's the way we did it for positioning and flights. So I'm four, three pulls off, I drop my pull off, and I look out and I see where we're going, and there's two MiGs in formation down there. We're, ju we're just south uh, and east of Kep, and they're out, like on outside downwind for Kep to, to go land. And I looked and I said, oh goodness gracious, there's two easy shots, you know. But he couldn't, he didn't know where he was, and I, I said, okay. and I told him to head east and so off we went to fly east but there was an opportunity wasted <laughs> well it, it happens were they um uh, you know uh, warsaw pack russian doctrine very command control yeah. driven gra ground mm -hmm. control not a lot of initiative with like our pilots did you were they aggressive or were they it was smart they, they were, were smart. smart yeah the first uh, losses of 105 to migs was april 4th 1965 and a good friend of mine, Jim Magnuson, remember I've been complaining about that nig out there? Yeah. He got shot down. Well, we were going to Thanwa Bridge, which is... What he's talking about for the folks at home is we have a 15 and a 17, 17. out front, and uh, Frank goes by and kicks them every chance he gets, but... <laughs> they shouldn't be there. There you go. <laughs> well, they're outside, you know, and they're not in the nice, comfy hangar. Anyway, we had about an 8,000-foot ceiling that day, and we went ahead and flew any, uh, anyway, which is really stupid. Because all the gunners know where, what your altitude is. Yeah. And out of these clouds comes two MiGs, and they shot down Jim Magnuson and Major Bennett. And uh, they, Jim Magnuson was in the first class of the uh, Well, they were uh, they 17s? Were yeah, uh, 17s, yeah. We never saw any 21s while I was 21s? There. Yeah, oh, all okay. 17s. These guys came out of the clouds, shot them down, and disappeared. And that was the end of that. You guys told me that the, who'd flown against a 17, that the, a very capable airplane, very big, maneuverable. Big guns. The 21, he said, if you see a 21 swaling, he's checking his six, you know, yeah. and a lot of speed, but, yeah. you know, get in, hit, and get out. I don't know whether that's true or not. Yeah. That's but what when I was there, that's what they were doing until I left. And that was, they were picking the most vulnerable moment for the Air Force pilot or Navy pilot, and that's when they would attack. And they'd hold their fighters off somewhere, out of sight, and and wait for that one moment to swoop in. Or maybe and egress out of the target yeah. or whatever. What uh, uh, did you know? There's there's always stories of in like World War II, right? And in Korea, a little bit with interaction with the enemy pilots. Was there any ever any interaction Not that I remember. with them or or none yeah. of that? They were just really smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. good guys. Good, very, or good very adversaries. Capable. Very, very capable enemy. Very capable. Which is, you know, if you think, if you read a lot, there's not a lot said about that. You know, in other yeah. words, that the, uh, yeah. the quality, and I've always been curious about that. So they were sense. quality aviators. Their tactics were just were superb. They were better than ours because they kept out guessing us. No matter what we did, they would do something to counter it. Yeah. Gordo, what do you think? Well, you know, they had uh, this little section of the war that they could send their best yeah. to instruct. They were instructing the North Vietnamese pilots. So you were getting the best, uh, it's like a, a red flag, or the aggressors. Right. They were sending their, quote, aggressor kind of people, quality people, to North Vietnam. So I, I don't know if they were flying the missions, but I assume they were. Uh, well, that was going to be my, you, you hit my next question, uh -huh. and we're going to wrap up. Russians, you think Russians flying them? I don't know. but uh, They were we, certainly flying in Korea. We know yeah, that now. Yeah. Well, we'll never know. We'll yeah, we'll, yeah we'll never know. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Well, you know, you always want to give uh, respect. You never, never underestimate the enemy, right? Which we kept that's doing. how you get killed. We kept doing it. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, Frank, Gordon, appreciate it very much. Go Air Force. Uh, if you're at home, come and visit us. These guys are actually here. They'll, they'll talk to you. And Frank will let you hold his compass, you know. <laughs> we'll do that as a fundraiser. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman, if I don't get hung up on this chair. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. I want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Under the Cowling. Remember, go out to that Facebook page, smash that subscribe button or like us on Facebook. Hit the web store. We can always use your donations. Thank you very much and have a great day.